Hello everybody. Today we are going to discuss using the 8L Tormach CNC lathe. Now specifically this video is going to be geared toward the parts that you'll be making for the intro to machining class, which is a small brass threaded rod that needs some turning to be done on the end of it and a little aluminum end cap that's part of the car jack project. But this video should serve as a nice introduction to anybody who wants to use this lathe. Now, to begin with, let me just say, this is a Tormach machine. It uses the PowerPoint, or I should say the Path Pilot software. Let me repeat that. It uses the Path Pilot software that is used uh, on the milling machines as well. So if you are familiar with that software, this may not be too difficult to get a handle on. Now, when you come to the machine, this is an enclosed machine. And when you come to it, uh, chances are the emergency stops have been tripped. Now this machine has two emergency stops, one there and one at the actual screen where the software is. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to twist. Now this, this e-stop twists to the right, or I should say uh, counterclockwise. No, that's clockwise, excuse me. And strangely enough, this one goes in the other direction, counterclockwise, to get it out of the e-stop position. Once you have uh, released both those e-stops, you need to push the reset button. You'll hear a little thud, that little blue light will come on, and at this point, we can go to the software. Now, the first thing that you do is very similar to what you do on the milling machine. You'll notice this reset button is flashing blue. You're gonna click it. It should then stop flashing. And now we must reference the machine. We'll first reference the X. Now on a lathe, the X represents the cross feed and it moves the tool as close to the enclosure as it can. And now I'm going to reference the Z by clicking reference Z. The Z is the longitudinal axis. Before you do that, make absolutely certain the tail stock has been moved all the way to the right and it's not locked. If the tail stock isn't moved to the right but not locked down, the machine will just push it over. But if it's locked down, it probably will cause some issues. Now, once the machine has been referenced, these X reference X and reference Z buttons should turn green. At this point, you are basically ready to use the machine. Before we get actually into learning how to use the machine, I just want to point out that it's really important to keep the machine clean. I just spent quite a bit of time cleaning it because students and other users tend not to keep it clean. The other thing I want to point out is in these drawers are pretty much everything you're going to need to do lathe work. <clears throat> in this drawer, there are many lathe tools. You can look for yourself, but all the important lathe tools are here for turning and facing and cutting off and threading. There's also drill chucks that go into the tailstock. There are also live centers and dead centers that are also part of the lathing uh, operations. All the tools on this lathe use inserts, and there are boxes of inserts that you can use when they are in need of being replaced. On the drawer on the right is your caliper, if everything's been put back, and there is a box of five seat collets. These will be used in the project that we're working on because we will be using the collets. When you finish using this lathe, it is really important that you put everything back and keep this lathe nice, neat, and clean, and don't lose any of the tools. Now let's get to actually how you use this machine. Okay, there is definitely some confusion when it comes to, to um, how to describe these lathe tools. So let me just pick up the tool that we were using. You can see it looks like it's made to machine on the left side. So for example, if, if I were machining this piece of aluminum, I could come in and machine this surface, but you realize I'm really machining the right side of this shoulder. Uh, you know, if I come in here, 
and machine this part of the piece, I'm also machining the right side of this shoulder. So this tool, which might look like, I would call this a left-handed tool maybe, is actually called a right-handed tool. And alternatively, this tool here, which looks like it's pointing to the right, would come in and machine, let's say, this surface. This would be the left side of the shoulder. So this is actually called a left-sided tool, okay? I wanted to get rid of that confusion. Now, what's also interesting is there's a whole assortment of tools you can get for the lathe. So you can go in and Google it, but if you were making a part similar to the one shown here, you would have to use all sorts of tools, some pointing to the left, some pointing to the right, some that kind of point perpendicular to, let's say, a taper that you might be making. And then at some point you might have to make a groove. So you might need a grooving tool. And at some point you might put threads into the piece. So you can see there's internal threads being cut here with a boring bar that has a threaded tool in it. And over here, there's external threads being cut by also a threading tool. And then over here, if you need to cut the material completely clean off, there's a cutoff tool. So there's all these tools. We have a lot of them in that drawer. Depending on what you're making, you may need to use all of these. As I've already mentioned, the lathe is fully enclosed. Now, when you lift the lid of this lathe up, there is a locking mechanism that when you now let it go, it locks. Just so everybody understands how this mechanism works, it's quite clever actually, but to release it, let me just see if I can close up a little bit on it. To release it, you simply lift, push the lid back a little and push in this part of the link, and then the door is free to close again, okay? So now, the other thing I want to mention is this lathe is very difficult to use when it's closed. I only keep it closed when I'm doing a big job cutting steel or I'm scared that chips might fly, very hot chips might fly out of the machine. Otherwise, the machine is rather inconvenient to use with the enclosure down. Now, we will be using it with the enclosure up. Now keep in mind, there's a lot of machines out there that have no enclosures. So it's not as if, you know, it's a requirement that a machine has an enclosure. Now, I wanna use it with the enclosure up, but there is a safety feature that prevents it from being done. There's a magnetic lockout right in this corner of the machine, right there where the door is. And to defeat that, we're going to take this small little magnet and we're going to place it approximately somewhere right over this magnet. That will fool the machine into thinking the door is closed and we can now use the machine fully open. Let me start by just identifying the common features that you'll find almost on any lathe. On the left, we have the headstock. Now presently mounted in the headstock is the three jaw chuck. If you are using the three jaw chuck, you must make sure the machine is in low gear. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Here is the apron. Here is our tool post. This is our tailstock. Presently mounted in the tailstock is a chuck for drilling. Alternatively, the chuck can be replaced with a live or dead center. The tool post works by, if you push this handle toward the middle of the lathe, it releases a locking mechanism and you can change out the tools like this. To change the tool, you simply select the tool you want, you put it in here and then move this handle toward you and that locks it into position. Attached to the side of the machine is our pulse generator. Now it has a magnet on it, so you can pick it up by hand and you can place it anywhere you want while you're working, which is quite convenient. Now when you are operating a CNC lathe, the two axes we are concerned with are the x-axis and the z-axis. This pulse generator also has a y and an a-axis, which we will not be using. Now, 
the x-axis should be thought of as diameter and the z-axis should be thought of as your left and right movement. The x-axis will allow the tool to move in and out and the z-axis will allow it to move left and right. You also have, like every other pulse generator, a resolution button. So when this is in times 100, the machine moves rather coarsely. In 10, it moves much less. And in one, it moves very, very slowly. Now, as usual, when you select an axis, I can tell you right now that the Z direction toward the headstock is negative. So for example, if I select Z and I notice this says positive this way, so clockwise rotation here is positive, counterclockwise rotation is negative. If I move it in the counterclockwise direction, that's the negative Z direction, you can see the tool is moving to the left. If I select the 100, you will notice that the tool moves very, very coarsely and I can move it left and right. If I select the x-axis, uh, negative should be toward the center. So that should be, again, counter uh, clockwise rotation of this handle. We'll move it into the center and the other way moves it back. And again, in 10, in 10 times mode, it moves significantly slower. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at what's under the hood of this machine. If we open up this door, it has a similar locking mechanism that the other uh, enclosure has. You can see here the object back here, this big white cylinder is our one and a half horsepower motor. It's belted to the spindle. Uh, right now it is in low gear because we have the three jaw chuck in there. And there's also another belt that comes off the spindle and goes to an encoder. Now, of course, with CNC machines, it's always important to have encoders on all your spindles. Down here is another motor, a stepper motor, I believe, which controls the uh, Z direction for threading. So you also have an automatic feed, obviously, and you can thread with this lathe. If you do wanna change the uh, gear, to a higher gear, you, you do it by simply moving the belt over. I will show you how that's done momentarily. Now, as I mentioned already, the three-jaw chuck happens to be in the lathe right now, and we would like to change it out to the collet attachment. The reason for this is we're going to be machining a threaded rod, and if you put a threaded rod and a three-jaw chuck and then clamp down on it, you'll probably do damage to the threads. So we're gonna put the collet attachment in and let me show you how that's done. Okay, before I change out the three-jaw chuck, I want a little bit of distance away from the uh, tool. So I'm going to move the apron of the lathe to the right. So once again, I'm going to select my Z-axis. I'll select the 100 to the right is positive, so I'm just gonna move it back here so it's just out of my way. At this point, I'm going to train our direction on this back part of the machine. Let me close up a little bit and show you the situation. There is a little knob here, it's spring-loaded. You can see if I push on it and let it go, it springs back out. If I push on this knob and rotate the uh, headstock or the spindle, there comes a few times when it will lock in. There are these little places where it locks in. Once it locks in, you hold this button down so it stays locked, and you now make sure you grab your handy dandy spanner wrench. I'm gonna stick it in one of these holes. You'll notice there's a little pin on this spanner wrench. I'm gonna stick it in that hole and give this a little tap and now I've loosened this part of the machine and I can start unscrewing it. Let me close back out here. As I start unscrewing it, I should be able to perhaps give this a gentle tap and out will come the three jaw chuck. Okay, now the three-jaw chuck kind of looks like a 5C collet. This, 
This entire back section looks like a 5C collet. There are threads on the outside of this, and that's what we were unscrewing just now. Now we're gonna replace it with the collet attachment. I actually forgot that because the three jaw chuck looks like a 5C collet, there really is no collet attachment. The collet attachment is permanently part of the headstock here. So we're now going, if you want to put a collet into the machine, which is what we're going to do now, you need to select which collet size you're gonna use. Now we're going to be machining a 5 16th threaded rod so we're going to select the 5 16th collet. So here it is. If the camera can pick that up, I think you can see it says 5 16th. Now, I'm not going to lie to you about this. This collet attachment on this 5L lathe is very finicky. You have to make absolutely certain you don't force this collet in the wrong way. Otherwise, it gets almost impossible to remove it. So we're, I want you to listen to what I'm about to say and please ab abide by what I'm about to say very carefully because it's super critical. The first thing you're gonna notice is that these collets have a keyway running down one side of them. It is super important that that keyway be put into the machine in a correct orientation before you try to tighten it. I'm going to hold the camera by hand to make sure I can catch this on the video. Now this is where the collet is gonna go. This little black line here indicates where inside this collet is the key that engages with the keyway I just mentioned. So once again, here is the, the 5C collet. I'm going to rotate it until I see this keyway I'm now, very important, want to make sure that the keyway in the collet lines up with this little black tab. See, the problem with this collet attachment is you can force the collet in without the, it matching up here perfectly, and then it becomes almost impossible to remove it. Now, without really forcing it, you should be able to get this to slide into that position right there. Okay, if it doesn't slide in, you need to move it around almost like you're cracking a combination lock or something until it moves in. Do not force it under any circumstances. Don't force it, okay? Now, once the collet is in, I'm gonna show you now how to tighten it up. Okay, the part that we're making is shown in this drawing. Now, this is a brass rod and the Part that the only thing we really have to do to it is to machine this section of the rod here down to uh, a 0.188 diameter, a length of 0.1375. Now this looks simple and easy to do, but what makes it difficult is this is a very long, skinny piece. And unless it's supported on its end while it's being machined, it will bend. It will bend because it's many diameters its length is many diameters and it's dangerous to put more than two or three diameters out of a lathe and try to machine it. It almost will always result in being bent unless it's supported a certain way. So even though this part looks innocent to make, we're going to have to do a little bit of extra work to make it come out right. Now to begin with, we're going to have to cut the rod to length. Now this is calling for eight and a half plus 1.375. Plus, I want to add about another half an inch that's going to eventually get cut off. So we're going to cut this rod to length. This is this brass rod is much longer than I need. I'm going to cut it by hand with a hacksaw, and I'm going to first lay out how long it needs to be, and I'm going to put it in a vise between two pieces of wood because I don't want to damage the threads. So let's do that. Okay, I have determined that I'm going to cut my brass rod uh, down to 10 and a half inches. The length of this piece is super uncritical. As mentioned before, a lot of the pieces of this jack are very forgiving, this design. You can be off by quite a bit, but we're still going to endeavor to make it as good as we can. So here's a little mark. I'm going to use my Sharpie, and now we'll just cut it off using a hacksaw. Okay, I've placed two pieces of wood in the vise to protect 
my threaded rod when I clamp it. I'm going to just clamp it between these two pieces of wood. Here's my hacksaw. Here's my line. I'm just having it stick out a little bit. And now I'm going to saw. I'm going to move the camera to this angle a little bit so that I can have a little elbow room. Brass is a very beautiful material to machine. It just seems like it's almost a magical metal. It forms very um, small, almost dust-like chips. So, I do believe this hacksaw blade probably needs replacement because that should have been much easier to cut. Um, after you cut it, you can give it a little bit of a file so that we can remove the burrs. I'm going to just give this a little file. The the reason for getting rid of these burrs is the collets are very high tolerance and if the diameter of this exceeds 5 16 by much it, it won't it'll be very difficult to get it into the collet so that looks good so let's go back over to the lathe now uh, here we are back at the lathe when we left we had just inserted the collet very carefully as i mentioned i'm going to put my rod in now initially i'm going to only allow a few diameters to stick out now you can see only a few diameters are sticking out there now i'm going to do the same process i'm going to push in this spring-loaded button and rotate the spindle until the button snaps in like that and I'm going to keep my finger on it and now I'm just going to turn this wheel as and you can see the collet is going in and getting tighter okay you can tighten it pretty well by hand and then just to give it that little extra I'm going to use the spanner wrench to give it that one last tight now you let go of this button, this is very important, make absolutely certain that that button springs out again and rotate it manually. Now remember, when this button is in, you can't rotate this, it's locked. Occasionally this button sticks in and when it does, the spindle can't move. So if you were to turn on, if this button somehow stuck in and you turn on the spindle, it will be bad because it can't move. So basically the motor could smoke. So just make sure this button pops out, make sure the spindle moves. I'm also going to uh, put the machine into high gear. So it had been in low gear because we were using the three jaw chuck. Now that we're using the collet, I'm gonna go into high gear. Now the way this belt is moved is, um, it's pretty simple. You, you wanna roll it off the bigger pulley onto the smaller pulley. So right now, this is the bigger pulley. I'm going to push the belt a little bit toward the spindle and get it to start rolling over the top of this spindle. Now this is all done manually. You can see I didn't quite go over. Let me do this again. And you'll notice the belt comes off now I'm going to move it onto the motor side and I'm going to again rotate it by hand until you get the belt to go on. So now we are on the high speed and we should be ready to go. Now once again, to get this uh, door to come back down, we are going to have to push up on it a little, push in on this link and then it will come down and close. We should be ready now to go on to the next step. Before I actually start machining, I want to examine my cutting tool. Now we're going to be do doing some simple turning and facing operations. So the tool I want to use is this right-handed tool. 
and I'm going to first examine it. Now, I'm taking the tool out of the tool post. I don't know if the video camera can pick this up. However, I'm looking at this insert and I'm noticing it's slightly chipped right here. So what I'm going to do is, now these inserts have two sides. I'm going to take out that little screw, turn around the insert so that we have a brand new cutting tool before we start this operation. To change these inserts, you have to look for this tool, which should be in the drawer. It's called a Torx wrench. These screws have a funny kind of a cross, a star shape is probably the best way to describe it on it. Do not lose this screw, please. If you do change the insert, make sure you're working over a table. If anything drops on the floor of this shop, chances are you're not gonna ever find it again. Now I'm looking at this insert this side looks good this side i don't think has been used yet these are very small inserts this is a very small lathe i should mention it's really not made for uh heavy duty lathing or particularly large pieces if you search youtube you'll find people using the 8l tormach lathe to cut things like titanium and all sorts of alloys that you wouldn't really think would be a good choice for this lathe um, I'm not sure they are, but the lathe can cut things like that. You'll notice they'll do cut it. Okay, we, the insert has been rotated around and I'm gonna put it back in the lathe and we can start the next thing. Okay, going back to the PathPilot software, uh, just to review it, if you haven't seen the video on the milling machine, let's go over a few of the things. I'm going to set the RPM to 1,000 and let me just make sure it says a thousand. Now it's important, I'll hit enter, so it pops it into the memory of the machine. Um, that's, this is where the RPM goes, right here. Um, let's see. It's important to recognize a couple of things. If you wanna turn the spindle on, this would be over here, spindle forward, and move over into this area. The software will not let you turn the spindle on unless you're in the main menu, okay? So I'm right now in the main menu. You can see the tab is highlighted. And I often forget to go into the main menu before I turn on the spindle. And when it doesn't turn on, I kind of think, what's wrong? But anyway, I'm gonna turn the forward button. It's always gonna be forward for what we're doing. And it comes on. If it doesn't come on, it might be because you haven't placed the magnet properly. So here we are with the lathe spinning. Now I'm gonna turn it off for a second just to go over a couple of things. You'll notice that the lathe always turns in a direction such that the material is rotating like this. It's important that the material come down on the cutter. So, on this lathe, as with most lathes, the cutter is going to approach the material here, and it is really important that the material come down on this cutter. If the, if the spindle is rotating the other way, the material will be wanting to pull this insert up and out, and there's no cutting surfaces on the bottom of it as well. So you, this is where the cutting surface is and the material always has to be coming down on it like this. Now there are some, there are some lathes you might see in industry that come from this side of the material. I've seen that. There are some CNC lathes where the cutter goes, comes from this side and when that's the case, then the spindle does turn in the opposite direction. But just remember, you know which way it should spin because the material always has to come down on top of the cutter. All right. After changing to the collet, I'm going to go to the settings tab and I wanna make absolutely certain that up here in this corner, let me see if I can focus in on that, zoom in on it, I should say. It says up here, uh, spindle pulley ratio options the collet high speed should now be selected. So I'm gonna select that. Just to make sure the machine knows we're in high speed now. 
So now we'll go back to the main menu and we will attempt our facing operation. The first thing I'm going to want to do is an operation called facing. When you remove material from the front of a piece of material and move along the x-axis from the outside to the center and remove the material and you make it shorter, that's called facing. Right now, since I cut this by hand with the hacksaw, it is very rough, it's very crooked, so I want to face it. So I'm going to turn on the lathe. Let me turn the spindle on forward. I'm going to grab my pulse generator and I'm going to select the z-axis and I'm going to move it over. I'm going to move the x-axis as well. When I get a little bit closer, I'm gonna move to the times 10 and let's see if we can can we get a little closer? I'm going to move it to the left until I just touch the brass stock. I can see some chips coming out. I'm now going to move it in the X positive direction, which is out. And now I'm just basically at the face of the material. I'm gonna move it a little bit to the left in the Z, and now I'm gonna come across it nice and slowly. I'm moving in the X negative direction right now and you can see I'm removing some chips. So I just want to make that flat. Let me turn it off and see if you've accomplished it. It's hard for the camera to see but there is a small part of this which hasn't quite gotten cut yet because it was pretty crooked. So let me take another pass. So I'm going to move a little bit more to the left, which again is negative Z. And now I'm going to move toward the center, which is also negative X. And I'm just using the pulse generator to move the axes now. Let me come back out. Let me just turn off the spindle. Okay, this is very flat and very nice. At this point, I would like to call this my Z0. So I'm now going to zero the Z axis on the software. Going to the Path Pilot screen, I'm still on the main menu. I'm going to click the zero Z, and you'll notice Z becomes zero. Okay, now you'll also notice that the diameter is reading a number 0.8036. I have no idea if that's the correct uh, diameter because I haven't calibrated my X yet. So now I have to go back to the lathe and I'm going to take a small little cut across the lathe in what's called turning as opposed to facing. We're now going to reduce the diameter and I'm going to remove enough of the material so the threads are gone so I can get a good measurement of the diameter. Well, here we are back at the lathe and maybe we can get, can we get even a little closer? Yeah, we can. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now we're going to do an operation called turning. Now, in order to do this, I'm going to move the tool a little bit to the left and I'm going to come in in the X direction until my tool just touches the outside diameter. I can hear some chips coming off. And now I'm going to move it to the right, which is positive Z. Now I'm gonna move it in a little bit more in the X, that's negative X to go in. And now I'm going to very slowly move it in the negative Z and take a pass. Now when you remove material like this, it's called turning. I'm just going to remove a little bit so I can get a measurement of this. Let me see if I've taken off the thread. I can still see there's just a few more threads left on there. So to get a really accurate measurement, let me take a little bit more off. Now it doesn't, it's not gonna take much because the threads were almost gone. So I'm just gonna move it in a little in the X and now take another pass from right to left. And 
and K. Now I'm going to measure the diameter. Now keep in mind, I have not moved the tool in or out. I merely moved it to the right. It's still at the exact same place it was when it took the cut. That's very important. Now I'm gonna measure the diameter. I've taken out our calipers. These are very nice calipers that we've recently purchased for you. I'm working in inches, so I, my caliper is in inches, and now I'm going to measure the diameter of this little, little piece that I just took off. 0.212. I think what I'll do is I'll move the tool away, and I'm gonna come in here so I can really get a nice very accurate measurement. I'm gonna squeeze my caliper together here. It's actually reading 0.211. I think it's about 0.211. So now let's go back to the software and enter that. Going back to the PathPilot software, you can see that the X diameter is reading 0.2136, which is pretty close. So I assume the person who used the lathe last probably did calibrate it. But let me put in 0.211. I think that's a little bit more accurate than the number that was there. So we have now successfully entered the two most important things. We've established our Z0 and we've established our X diameter. Now, if everything holds, we can use the numbers that we see on the screen now to uh, measure, effectively tell us how far we've cut. Now, the next operation we're gonna do might seem a little bit weird. You might not understand why we're doing it, but it will become apparent as the uh, part progresses and you see why we're doing it. There is uh, sheets of paper which describes exactly the operations that we're going to do. So if the video is unobservable uh, or, or you, you just can't deal with it, you do have this sheet of paper. Now what we're going to do now is we're going to machine a little nub onto the end of this piece. And it's going to be about point, it's gonna be a little smaller in diameter than what our final diameter is. So I'm going to make this about 0.18 in diameter. It says to go in about a half an inch. So let's do that. I'm gonna do it manually using the pulse generator. I could program this, but I'm not going to do it because I don't, I'm not there yet. I want a little bit more experience using the pulse generator. So again, none of these dimensions are particularly critical. So we're looking to get to about 0.188 in diameter and about a half an inch in. So. Now keep in mind, I only have a few diameters sticking out. That is important. If you stick too much of this material out, it will definitely bend. Now I'm gonna go in nice and slowly. I'm gonna to go to about the half inch mark. I'm looking at my screen. I'm looking at the Z on my screen. And I'm gonna just see where a half an inch takes me. Going in nice and slowly. Making absolutely certain that I don't run the tool into the collet. The machine will let you do that. These machines, they might be computer controlled, but they're not that smart. So this is about the half inch mark. I'll show you the screen real quick. As you can see, I'm at negative 0.5 in the Z and I'm at 0.211 in the X and I wanna get down to about 0.18. So let's just see where we are. Our tool is right there. So this looks great. I'm just gonna maybe take one more pass to finish this off. So let me just get the camera good. I'm gonna come back out in Z, which is positive Z, to the right is positive. I don't have, I only have about 20 thousandths to take off. Let's just do this. Uh, I think I can do this in one pass. So I'm gonna go right to the one 
6.18 diameter. And we will go across in the Z. I'm going to go to the half inch mark, or I should say minus 0.5 because I'm moving to the left, and that's it. Okay. That finishes my first operation, and now I'm going to drill a center hole in that. I'll try to describe what we're going to do next. We're going to take this stubby drill, which is called a center drill. Now it happens to have a 60 degree angle here. This tapered part of the drill is 60 degrees. We're gonna drill that drill into the brass piece that we just machined in enough to, cr to have some of that 60 degree taper. The reason being is we're going to eventually use this center this is called a live center. It's on a bearing and it can rotate. This also has a 60 degree angle. So after we drill that hole, this center should be able to go into that hole and support the piece. And we'll be able to extend it beyond the two or three diameter rule. And we'll be able to put the piece in a position where we can now cut it on the lathe. Right now, what we have inserted into our tail stock is what's called a keyless chuck. Now, let me explain. If you rotate this handle, let me make sure this is all in the video. If you rotate this handle, it moves the tail stock in and out, moves it left and right. All of these uh, tools that go into this part of the tailstock have a taper on them. And the way you remove them is if you keep moving this toward the base, there'll come a time when it hits a stop and it will actually take this tool out. So this is how these tools get changed. Now, in order to put it back in, make sure some of this is sticking beyond the stop. And all you have to do is push it in. Now you give it a nice snap like that, and this chuck should now be firmly in the tailstock. I'm now going to put our center drill into the chuck by rotating this, the three jaws of this chuck will start to come together. Okay, I'm going to tighten this by hand, there's no key, and we should be in a position to drill. Now, there's a little handle in the back of the tail stock. That lock, if you move that handle up, it locks the tail stock to the bed of the lathe. We're going to be drilling and I need to slide this closer to the material. So, let's do that. Let's get this drilling operation done. First, I'm going to move the tool away. This is going to be positive X motion. I'm also going to move it closer so I can get closer with this drill. I'm going to slide this up to about here and I'm going to lock the tail stock to the bed. This is now locked. Let's start the spindle going and I'm going to actually do the drilling now. Let's see if we can get it close. Maybe I'll hold it by hand, might get in, in a little bit. Okay. I'm going to just... Brass is a very forgiving material, as I mentioned. I'm not using any coolant here. It's never a bad idea to use coolant, but I'm not going to use it. I'm drilling this so that, again, I picked up some of that taper. Let me unlock it, move it back, and hopefully you can see I picked up some of that taper. Everyone sees there's some taper there. 
So here's what we need to machine onto the end of this. Now you have to keep in mind that little piece we just machined is eventually gonna get cut off. So from the shoulder we've created, we're, we have to go 1.375. So I'm now going to loosen the collet and pull out more of that brass rod so I have at least an inch and a half sticking out and I mean measured from this shoulder. Not from the very end, but I want at least an inch and a half sticking out measured from that shoulder. It's always good to repeat things when you're learning. So let's lift up this section of the machine. If you remember, we need our little spanner wrench, which I'm going to grab. To loosen this collet, again, I push this in and rotate it until it pops in. And now I have to loosen the collet and it should be going away from me to loosen it. So I was able to loosen it pretty easily by just giving it a little turn. The collet should be free now. And if I come over here, let's just see if we can get a little closer to this machine. I'm now gonna pull off, pull out some of this rod. Now, like I said, I want at least an inch and a half measured from this shoulder. So here we go, something like here. The less I stick out, the better, because it has a less chance of bending. But I don't wanna be too close, because I definitely don't wanna run the tool into the uh, headstock, that would be bad. So with enough of that sticking out, I'm gonna push my button in again, and just make sure that gets on the camera. I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna rotate this till my button goes in. I'm gonna tighten that and then give it just a little extra tight with the spanner wrench. I'm gonna close up the door. And now let's go back over here. Now you have to take my word for this or maybe one day you'll try it and notice it for yourself. But if we were to try to machine this shaft right now, there are so many diameters sticking out of the headstock that this will start to bend as it gets skinnier. So to prevent that from bending, we're going to support it on this side with what's called the live center. Now to put the live center in, I must first take out the chuck and put the live center in. So let's do that. I think I'll be good and I will first remove my drill bit, which I will put back where it belongs. Now, if you remember to get rid of these, or to, I shouldn't say get rid of, but to remove the drill chuck from the tailstock, I have to rotate the handle, let this gap close up until it pops out. Sometimes you have to give it a little extra turn and now we're going to put in the live center. So again, after you remove one of the tools from the tailstock, turn it back out. You need a little bit of, of this sticking out, otherwise this won't go in. And I'm going to snap in the live center. And again, the fact that this rotates, that's why it's called a live center. Now to support this, I'm going to slide the tail stock into position. You'll see it starting to come into position. And I'm going to start rotating. I'm rotating the handle now, and I'm bringing out more of the tail stock. And I wanna make sure that it goes into that hole. Now at this point, I'm going to lock with this handle, I'm gonna lock the tailstock to the lathe bed, and now I'm going to continue to rotate this handle a little bit and create a little pressure with this center. So let me turn the lathe on. I think you can see that this center is spinning. If I back it up, you'll notice that this is no longer spinning, and this piece of brass is no longer being supported on its end. So now I'm going to, again, I'm rotating this handle, 
I'm going to allow the live center to engage with the hole I just drilled. You'll see it start to spin. Now give it another little turn to give it a little pressure. And now we're gonna lock it in position with this locking handle. Okay, we're now in a position to do the rest of the machining operation. Okay, let me hold the camera by hand just so we can get a really good view of what's happening. Now, here is our brass piece. It's held in the collet on the left side. It's being supported by the live center on the right side. I think you can now see the reason for this initial machining operation. We're now going to have to do machining we're going to have to machine the rest of this rod down to a certain diameter and I think you can see without making this initial machining step that we did there'd be no clearance for the tool to get in because this diameter is going to get pretty skinny you need some clearance otherwise this tool would run into this center and we don't want that to happen so that's why we created this little piece we also made this little piece slightly smaller in diameter than the diameter that we're going to machine this to. So theoretically, we should never be cutting in here. Now, we're ready to machine this section down to 0.188, 1 and 375 inches long. So to do that, again, we could do it manually using the pulse generator. It wouldn't take long because there's not a lot of material we have to remove. However, let's use some of the functionality that this great CNC lathe has and make life a lot easier for us. Now, typically when you're using a CNC lathe to make a part, you will often be using multiple lathe tools. And all the tools have different geometries. And for the CNC machine to know how to position each tool, it has to know what's called its offsets. It's very similar to the milling machine. However, on a lathe, it has two offsets. It has an X offset, X offset, and a Z offset. Now, it's similar to the milling machine in that the milling machine only has a Z offset, but it also has the diameter of the tool entered in the tool table. That can kind of also be considered sort of an offset of sorts. Now, we're only going to be using one tool. So in order to get its offset, it's quite simple. Now, if you recall, we've already calibrated the X and the, well, we're going to re-establish our Z0, but the X diameter is actually correct already. And since this is the only tool we're going to use, it should be very easy for us to enter its offsets. Now, before we do it, I'm going to position my Z in a new place. Okay. It's now time to use some of the conversational codes that are built into this machine to do this operation we need to do. Now, first off, I want to take off, I want to reduce this diameter to 0 0.188, 0 0.188, and measured from this shoulder, from this shoulder here, it should be, go down 1.375 inches to the left. So in order to make use of these conversational codes, we have to do two things. We first have to establish this as our Z0, and we have to establish the tool offsets. So let me move the machine into a position. Now this Z0 is not super critical, so I'm going to just move the tool close. And I think that's pretty close to Z0. So I'm gonna go back to my software here and I'm going to type, I'm gonna tell it to zero the Z. Now the X diameter should still be reading correctly because we have not changed that. We're now gonna make sure we have the proper offsets. So to do that, now we only are using one tool, the offsets for calculating one tool is pretty straightforward. Now first off, I'm going to go to the offset tab, and up here, I'm going to tell the machine we're using tool one, and I'm going to tell it to reset tool. I'm going to select from this chart a diagram that looks similar to the tool I'm using, and I'm now going to enter the values. Now keep in mind, since we're only using one tool, 
the diameter and the Z are exactly the same. I'm going to enter it here. So according to this, the diameter is 0.3475. You have to hit enter twice and you notice the X becomes green. I'm going to enter zero for the Z, hit enter twice, and the touch Z becomes green. Now, if we had other tools, for example, let's say I was using three or four tools, everything, the next tool's offsets would be all relative to these offsets. So we'll make another video or you can look online how to do offsets for multiple tools. But once this offset has been established, I'm going to go back to the main menu. Let's look at this screen and see if we can just go over it and enter everything we need to. First off, we're going to do an outside diameter turn. So we've selected the correct tab. You can do internal, ID turn, profile, face, chamfer, all kinds of common operations are found on this conversational tab. So we're going to do an OD turn. We are in fact using tool number one. Now our initial diameter is 5 sixteenths, which is 0.3125. We are going to go down to a final X diameter of 0.188. Our Z zero is where we're gonna start from. So that is perfectly good. Um, we're not going to have a radius here. We're going to go for a sharp edge because of the way this jack is designed. We want a sharp edge there. Our end point, now remember it's going to be negative because it's to the left of zero, is going to be 1.375 negative. And that's basically all we have to enter. Now, if we go over to this section, G54 tells the machine to go to the X0, Z0 we, we have um, established. These are the various spindle speeds. Now, maybe this is max spindle speed. Um, this is our roughing in inches per revolution. This is our finishing in inches per revolution. These figures all look good. We can give you some guidance on how to set that up if you have any issues. So having set all these parameters, this looks extremely good. I'm going to tell it to post the G code. So right here, right over here, I'm gonna hit post. I'll put it in the Bob folder. I'll call it, uh, okay, I'll call it, maybe I'll use my uni up here in the title box. I'll call it RS46 brass rod NC, that stands for uh, NC file, maybe numerical control, and I'm gonna hit save. Okay, up comes the G code right here, and it looks good, and it kind of shows you a graphical representation of what it's going to do. Okay, we already, it, uh, created our conversational code which is shown here there's a very important step that you must do now once you establish your Z0 it is very very important to hit this set G 30 there is a piece of the G code which is going to tell the machine to go to the position that's been established by G30. It can really be any safe position, but I'm going to make it the position it's at right now. So I'm going to say set G30 right there. Now, with this ready, with all of these parameters set, we should be pretty much ready to run the program. Okay, with everything set on the conversational side, and the tool in the correct position. We're ready to run the G code. I'm going to hit the start button. Spindle should come on. And now to run the G code, I hit the cycle start button.
again. I think you can see the need for the little part that we machined ahead of time. It's clearance. You'll see the tool. It really needs a place to go into. Without that little extension piece that we made, machining this would be very, very difficult. This should be the last pass. I see it says 188 on the screen. You'll notice it does a nice little finish into the shoulder. So after it finishes this cut, you're going to see that it will come in and do a, just a cut on the shoulder right there. And then it's done. Let's see how good the part came out in terms of diameter. Wow, 188 exact. It's my, my caliper slipped a little when I pulled it out. But you'll have to see what I'm talking about. 188, 189, that is really, really good. Now, this part is basically finished. I can retract the center. I can move in that that is movement in the positive Z direction. Now the only thing I have to do now is take it to the vise and just cut off this little nib and then I can take it to the sander and sand it. And that's all you have to do for this part. Okay, here's the finished part I just made on the lathe. And this, it's hard to see in the camera, but this was the little sacrificial piece we made. So I'm just gonna cut it off. Now, the vise usually leaves some sort of mark on a piece. So if you can put the part you're gonna cut off anyway in the vise, then if it leaves a mark on it, I don't really care. So I'm sticking that little nib in the vise. Let me move the camera over to give myself some cutting room. I just changed the blade on this. This is the fine blade. There are two hacksaws here. One has a fine blade and one has the coarse blade. I had felt that the uh, last time I used this saw it seemed very dull. So now I'm gonna see if we can do a little bit better with this one. Just a little trouble getting it started. I have to say that didn't cut off as easily as I thought it would. Um, but anyways, it's pretty simple to cut that off. Now normally I would take this rough edge now to the sander. Our sander is out presently, so hopefully it'll be back in, in operation soon. Um, if you bring this back to the lathe and try to face this, you risk bending it, because now it will be sticking out, it will not be supported, so I would not do that. So if the sander is out, let's just go back to old school methods, grab a file. It really will only take a few strokes, and then you can, you can angle the file a little like this, and put a chamfer on it. And this looks fine. Now the next piece we're gonna make is an aluminum cap. And if, if the cap is made properly, then um, this piece should fit into the cap. Now if it doesn't, we might want to open up the, the hole that we drill in that cap before we take it off the lathe. So I would recommend bringing this brass piece to class on the day you make the end cap. You may have to make some minor adjustments. The next piece we're going to make on the lathe is this aluminum end cap. It's, it calls for a half inch diameter piece of stock, aluminum, and one inch long. Uh, again, the length dimension has very, very sloppy tolerances, but um, maybe I'll just show you how you can get something to be a very precise length on the CNC lathe. So what we're going to do is just cut a piece of half inch uh, round stock, a little more than an inch, face both sides, and just drill some holes in it's all we're going to have to do. Okay, well, let's do that. 
Okay, we're going to take a half inch diameter aluminum rod stock. We're going to lay out a little bit more than an inch. Take out my trusty steel ruler. I'm going to cut it just a little over an inch long. Let's move over to the vise. If you're concerned with marking the aluminum up with the jaws of the vise, you can choose to put a piece of wood between it. I hope the cutting will go better. I've taken the coarse blade this time. Usually the coarse blade works really well on aluminum. Let me just see. huge fans of having students cut round stock on the bandsaw because the blade sometimes gets the round stock spinning and it kind of it can be scary it can kind of kind of push it right out of your hands but there's really no major issue with cutting round stock on the bandsaw you just need to be taught certain technique for doing it that will make it a lot safer so that's maybe in a future lesson but now back to the lathe so we can make this piece Okay, we're back at the lathe. Now the 5 16th collet is still in place from the previous job we did. And now we're working with half inch stock. So we're gonna have to swap out that collet. So once again, I'm just going to rotate the spindle while pushing the button and making sure it locks in. At this point, I'm just going to rotate the knob until, make absolutely certain, we've rotated it enough so that this collet comes out. So I will now get the half inch collet. Okay, I have obtained the half inch collet. Now I can't emphasize this enough. Once again, we're going to put it into the machine. Now make sure you locate where the keyway is on that collet, it's right here. Now also make sure you rotate the collet uh, sleeve until that black mark is lined up with this key that's in the collet, this keyway. So I'm going to put the black mark at about the 12 o'clock position with my keyway in the same position. Remember, I'm not going to force it. I'm just going to see if I can gently get it to go in. Now, once you can get it to go in all the way, you're kind of home free. At this point, I can put in the aluminum stock. Okay, now there are some pretty serious burrs on the edges of this aluminum where I cut it with the hacksaw. The burrs are sufficient that this piece will not fit into the collet because these collets are very precise. So um, again, I'm just going to take a hand file. If you're lazy, you can put it up against the uh, sander. Once I've done that, I'm going to stick it in. Should fit in the collet now. It's a pretty tight fit, but it did fit in. And now I'm just going to tighten the collet again. I'm rotating, pushing the knob in until the collet gets tight. I'm going to use the spanner wrench to give it a slight snug tight. Then I'm letting go of the button and I'm just making sure I can rotate the spindle by hand. We should be ready now to face. I think I'm just going to get this piece to the one inch size first. So I'm just going to simply face one side and then turn it around face the other side. So I'm going to turn the spindle on um, using a speed of a thousand. And I'm just going to use the pulse generator 
Again, I'm going to move in the negative Z direction. You see the tools starting to come into the picture. Now this is also in the negative X direction. What I like to do is to just touch the face slightly until I see a few chips come off. Just like that. I'm gonna come out. I'm gonna move a little few clicks to the left and then I'm just gonna come in and face it. Okay, now that side is very nicely faced. Now it might still have a burr on it. So, let me move the tool out of the path so we can see this. The lathe is still spinning. It's spinning toward me. I can take a file now and just kiss this edge with the file. That's a nice way of removing any burrs and putting a little chamfer on the piece. We're going to flip it around now and get the other side. I like to show you the things that can go wrong. So I just loosened the collet. You can see I can push quite a lot of the collet out and I'm still having a uh, devilish of a time pulling this piece of stock out because as I said, these collets are tight. And of course, this is just inexpensive stock, so it might be a little oversized. So I'm going to have to remove the entire collet. They are hollow, fortunately, and I'm gonna have to tap something in from the back of this to get it out. So. I'm going to, um, let me see, I'm going to use this screwdriver to see if I can just gently tap it out. Make sure the screwdriver is actually a little too big in diameter. This, this blade is too big in diameter to go into this collet, so I'm going to find something else. Well, one thing nice about working in a machine shop is there's no shortage of stuff you can find to do this. So now I'm just going to see if I can tap this and get it out. I'm going to go over to the table to do that. Okay, I successfully got the piece of metal out. Now I have to put the collet back in. Don't forget what I told you. I'm gonna move the black stripe to the 12 o'clock position. And the key, the keyway is also in the 12 o'clock position and I'm gonna gently rotate until I can get it to go in, no forcing. And now i am put the stock back in here tighten it up okay we're ready to face this side okay we're ready to face this side now same technique I'm gonna come in until I just touch getting some chips, then I'll come out, I'll move a little more to the left, which is negative, and now this is a negative X direction to go toward the center, it's always negative to go toward the center. <clears throat> I think I need to take a little bit more off of that. That's faced. Now, as I mentioned, the length of this piece is not very critical, but let's say it was. Let's say this had to be exactly an inch. How would you get it to be an inch? This is how you do it. Now that both sides are faced, we know that the both sides are, are parallel to each other. I would take this out of the collet, measure its length, its present length. Let's say, for example, it's 1.1 inches long. I would put it back in the collet, touch my tool to the very end to the very end of this set my z to be equal to zero and then remove 0.1 inches from it okay if you make your measurements accurately and you take your time you can get the length to be exactly what you need we don't care that much so since it was so, so painful to take it out of the collet i'm just going to go to the next step as you can see the next step calls for a 0.188 drill to be drilled into the end of this a half an inch deep. 
okay? Now remember, we always spot drill first and then we use the actual drill. So I'm going to get a .188 drill and a spot drill and we'll come back and do this. Okay, we're going to drill now and I have to take the center, live center out of the tailstock. So if you recall, the way that is done is you move this all the way back and eventually when it gets very close to the end, when this gap almost gets to be very close to, to zero, this should pop out. There she goes. And now I'm going to replace it with the chuck. Now remember, you have to make sure there's a little bit more of this sticking out and we'll just stick this in like that. At this point, I'm going to take the spot drill and I'm going to put that in here. Now these spot drills are double-sided very often. If that's in case one, break, one side breaks, you have another one. So um, it's possible that one of the sides is already broken. So before you use the spot drill, make sure there is in fact a drill there. I'm gonna tighten this by hand. I'm going to put this back in the drawer and now we'll, we'll do some uh, spot drilling. Should be ready now to spot drill the end of this piece. Got the spindle going at about a thousand. I'm not going to go in very far, so I'm not going to use coolant for this operation. Just going in, getting a little of the taper picked up, and that's really all you have to do for spot drilling. The next drill is called for is a 0.188 drill. That's sort of between a number 12 and a 316. So I've got a number 12 drill here. I have a piece of tape that I've placed a half an inch in from the end. So this is supposed to be a half inch deep. Alternatively, there are some designations on this tail stock. However, they're hard to read. So I'm going to just use the tape mesh method. It's very, um, it's not super precise, obviously, but this hole does not have to be very precise. I'm also going to set it up very close, lock my tail stock, and I will be using some whey oil for this. I am going to use a little whey oil, just so you can get an idea. I can tell right away I have a very bad drill here. It's not cutting at all, so I'm gonna have to change out my drill. Okay, I have changed my drill bit. Hopefully this one is sharp enough to do the job. Oh, what a difference. to do a little pecking here. So. After you finish drilling this piece of aluminum, you should see if your brass rod fits into it. If it doesn't, open up the hole a little bit. This fits in really nicely, so I'm going to leave it exactly the way it is. If, however, it doesn't fit, just take the next size drill and drill it open a little bit. Okay, we've just drilled this hole into this side of the part. Now on the other side, we have to drill and then tap an 832 threaded hole. So we have to determine what size drill is the drill you use for an 832 hole. So to do that, we'll go to the tapping or the drill chart and we'll get the right drill. So I'm up in front of the drill chart, which is right in between the two drill presses here. And I'm looking at the 832 column and right there it says number 29 drill. So that is the drill that we'll be using. I have flipped the piece around and we're just gonna again, always center or spot drill. 
So we're going to spot drill before going in with the 29 drill. Alright, so now we'll get the 29 drill and go in a quarter of an inch. I once again put a piece of tape to mark off approximately a quarter inch depth. That's what we want this drill to go. I'm going to use a little oil during this drilling operation. This is a very short little drill, so I'm not really anticipating much of an issue. Just go up to the tape. Okay. That should complete all we have to do on the lathe for this part. The rest is going to be done at the drill press. Okay. We've drilled the number 12 hole, uh, which is about 0.188 in this side, and a number 29 drill in this side. This, 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 the 29 drill went in about a quarter of an inch, and the number 12 drill went in about a half an inch. And now we're going to take this to the drill press to finish it. I'm going to need the 29 drill again, so I'm going to take it with me. And we're going to go to the drill press right now and use a jig that we've already created. So looking back at the drawing, I uh, realized that we've, we've drilled that hole and we've drilled this hole. We now have to drill perpendicular to the axis that goes through the center. So to do that, we're going to use this jig. Now one of these holes, this is going to be a .188 or 1875 hole for the handle, and this is going to be another 832 tapped hole. So the side that has the bigger hole in it is going to get the the number 29832 tap hole. So here is the jig that's been created. Um, notice that uh, this, this part has, it says bottom, so we're gonna put that like this. Now the number 29 side is stamped on, the, on this, so it's, this is gonna get the number 29 drill on this side. And again, that's the, uh, the part of the part that has the big hole in it, that's gonna get the 29 drill. So this is important, you don't wanna make a mistake here. The part that has the bigger hole in it, I'm going to stick in the jig where it says 29, okay? And it's gonna go right in here. It's a little tight. Let me get that in. That was a little tighter than it normally is. I'm going to now stick this in the jig like this. I'm just gonna hand tighten it with the screw like this. And now we're gonna go to the drill press and drill a 29 hole. It's gonna only go halfway through, so we're gonna feel for when it goes halfway through. I'm over at the drill press here and I'm going to put the 29 drill in the drill chuck. Now this is a keyed drill chuck. So make sure you grab the key, tighten the drill chuck with the key and make sure you put it to the side. Now here is the vise. I'm going to stick the jig that we've already prepared in here. There are two shoulders that you can rest this on. Now the way this vise works is you squeeze it with this handle in the back vertical. You squeeze this as tight as it can go and then when you push this handle down like this, it gives us an extra squeeze. I'm going to line this up pretty, pretty well until the drill bit goes basically right into the hole. Now remember, this hole is only gonna go halfway through. You'll feel it when you break through. If you make a mistake and go all the way through, it really won't make much of a difference. I'm putting this on. I should mention that the speed of this can be changed up here. That's the speed changer. Now, if you want to change speeds, you do it with the machine on. And with the machine turning, you can rotate this knob. That increases the speed. You can rotate it the other way to reduce the speed. Make sure you don't rotate it below 450 because it causes the mechanism to flip all the way over to 4700. So just Stay a little shy of 450. I'm setting the speed up for 1,000. I'm going to use, again, just a teeny bit of oil when drilling this. Let me see if I can close up. And I'm just gonna come down. I 
I can feel it. I went halfway through. I'm going to stop the drill press. Now I have to drill a 3 16 hole or a 188 on the other side. I now have to pull this out of the jig. Now, if you have trouble pulling your piece out, there is a hole that goes all the way through the jig and you can push something through that and get your piece out. But I believe I'm able to get this out by just pulling it apart. So now I'm going to take the side that has the small 29 drill in it and that's gonna go in the other side of the jig. I'm gonna put that all the way down. Now I'm gonna drill a number 12 drill through this hole. Let me put this back so you can see it. I'm putting this back like this, hand tightening that screw, putting it back in the vise. grabbing a number 12 drill. I'm putting it in the drill shock again, tightening it up with the key. Make sure you take the chuck away. Now we're going to line it up like we did before. That looks very good. Let me see if I can close up a little bit on it. Once again, I'll give it a little oil and now this one goes all the way through. You can peck a little bit at it. Make sure that this jig doesn't come up. And I think I went all the way through. So yes, you can see uh, that that hole went all the way through and this one only went halfway through. Now we need to just tap these two holes and then this piece will be finished. Okay, I have my tap handle or tap wrench. They go by the same name. And I have two 832 taps. This one on the left is the starter tap. It's the tapered tap. And this one is the bottoming tap. Now these are really short screw or threaded holes we're making, but it might still make sense to use the starter tap because sometimes starting a tap with the finishing tap is a little tricky. Now I'm going to always use oil when I do tapping. This is a very short tapped hole. I'm not going to use anything to line up the tap wrench. I'm just going to work it in manually letting it go in as perpendicular, perpendicularly as I can. If this is slightly out of perpendicular, it really won't matter very much. Now be very careful when, when this tap bottoms out at that hole, if you, if you keep screwing it in, it's gonna snap. These taps are pretty easy to break and you have to be very, very careful when you're using them. It's good to keep the chips away. I'm now changing to the bottoming tap. The reason being is I'm not sure the very bottom of this hole I just tapped went all the way down. I don't know if there's threads at the very bottom of it. And if there aren't, when you try to put your set screw in, it isn't gonna go all the way through. So that looks great. Now I'm gonna switch back to the starting tap because I have to tap another hole. Now, the hole we're tapping now is this one right here on the top. So I'm gonna, I'll hold my piece like this. Again, I'll use a teeny bit of oil. And again, this is the starting tap. I know it's not gonna go in very far is the second the bottom of this tap hits the bottom of the internal hole in there, it won't be able to go anymore. But take your time with tapping. The second you feel too much resistance, stop rotating the tap, take it out, switch out to the bottoming tap, and we'll just run this in. 
there should be some residual oil left, and this is only going to tap a teeny tiny part of this hole, the very bottom. Okay, I can feel it, it went in. And this part is now finished. Now, if you want to make this part look nicer, you can put it back up on the lathe, stick it in the collet, and use some sands. With half of it sticking out, you can put some sandpaper or emery cloth to this and shine it up. Then you can flip it around and shine up the other half, and you can get this really bright and shiny if you want. But that's basically how you make that entire piece.